great. Okay, well, I guess um, we are going to get started here. So let's see here. So welcome, everybody, to tonight's uh, Petaluma Riverside chat. I'm Jessica McCready, and I am your host for the evening and a master's in the North Bay Rowing Club here in Pet on the Petaluma River in California. Um, tonight's chat is I'm very excited about having it. Um, we're going to be talking with uh, Olympic champion Lindsay Shoup, among other things. She's an Olympic champion, among other things. Okay. And uh, to discuss the contents of her new book, Better Late Than Never. Believe great. Me, Better Great. Better Great. I'm sorry. Go on. Oh my God. Sorry. Not first time. <laughs> no, I'm sure not, but I, you know, Better Great <laughs> Than Never, Believing It's Possible Where Champions Begin. Sorry. And, um, uh, things we can learn as coaches and athletes in the sport of rowing. So before we get into discussion, just a brief comment about these chats and our upcoming schedule. Uh, the Pelo Riverside Chats is a venue to enhance uh, attendees' joy and knowledge of rowing and raise awareness of our beloved uh, local Petaluma River watershed and the goings on of the greater Petaluma River community. Um, the Petaluma Riverside Chat recordings are accessible on the via Petaluma Riverside Chat YouTube, and I posted that link on, on the chat. Excuse me. A quick reminder, if you do not wish to be recorded, you can watch li live with your video off. And um, the dates and times of the upcoming chats, which I'm going to just mention in just a second, are posted on the About page on the Petaluma Riverside Chat um, YouTube channel. And please email me if you um, would like to get the Zoom links to the upcoming chats, and also if you have any suggestions for guests and topics as well. Um, and uh, as I said, I posted the email and the YouTube channel on the Zoom chat. Um, now, if you'd like, if you haven't already, just go ahead and post where you're logging in from and, um, and also maybe anything that's sustaining you right now in these tricky times. Um, and just as a way for people to see and sort of get an experience of community tonight. Um, let's see here. Um, regarding the upcoming chat schedule, um, mixing things up a little bit, we're gonna um, focus on the fish and wildlife of the Petaluma River next in our upcoming chat on Wednesday, February 17th with Dana Riggs. She's CEO and founder of Principal Biologist and principal biologist of Soul Ecology and North Bay Rowing Club member. Um, and she'll present on that as well as including some cool photography tips. And uh, we're looking forward to potential, Lindsay and I are still in conversation about if it will happen later this month, but potentially doing another session with Lindsay, yay. Um, focused on movements and warm-up techniques, things to enhance our rowing experience and just living in our bodies experience. <laughs> Um, March 3rd at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I just note that time because it's very different. Our usual times are usually around 5 or 6. This one will be at 3 p.m. with um, Sage Roundtree, and that's going to focus on, um, she'll have, present a lecture and then some easy yoga practice and then a Q&A. She's a yoga teacher that focuses on yoga for athletes, and she's an author of a uh, a number of books, but a couple that I highly recommend is Athlete's Guide to Yoga and Athlete's Guide to Recovery. Um, she's uh, taught at a variety of locations, including the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. And then next, uh, we'll have Soma State Professor Nicole Myers. She'll be joining us in mid-March. She'll be focused on the geological origins and evolution of the Petaluma watershed. And we have some unconfirmed um, guests that are going to be focusing on the um, uh, float house on the Petaluma River. So let's see, without ado, let's go ahead and we're, welcome to everybody again. And I'm really excited, as I said, to have Lindsay here tonight. Um, I first met Lindsay through the uh, virtual U.S. rowing camp for masters that happened in the fall. And it was, <laughs> it was just delightful. Um, I One of the things I took away, which just impressed me so much, was how efficient she could 
she was showing us some moves to actually incorporate stretching and strength training and aerobics all, all at the same time. And it was just as a warm up, it was really great. And um, hopefully we'll be able to do some of that later on this month with her again. Um, let's see. Lindsay is an Olympic gold medalist. She helped lead the women's eight to the gold medal at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. She's a three-time world champion, a National Rowing Hall of Fame inductee, a coach, an author of a new book, great, Better Great Than Never, which we'll get in more detail tonight again. And she's a speaker and lifelong athlete. She has a master's degree in education and is a certified strength coach strength and conditioning specialist, and with a focus on performance optimization and longevity throughout sport and life, she focuses, she hosts, excuse me, clinics for coaches, athletes, and teams of all ages and skill levels. She's a commentator for U.S. Rowing and a speaker for events at major universities and corporations. Um, she lives in Florida, where she daily seeks to mentor, inspire, and improve the lives of others by sharing her journey of self-discovery from ultimate defeat to Olympic gold. So please join me in welcoming our guest, Lindsay Shoup. And I'm gonna, I will, I will pin us so we can do that. There we go, okay, nice. I will go ahead and jump right in by reading a little piece um, from the book at Jessica's request. Um, and I won't, I won't make it too long because you know, you can read the rest if you'd like. But I thought that um, this piece would kind of resonate with everyone because there are some things that we all go through, namely seat racing and making teams and dealing with the like, what if, what's happening now? I don't know, you know, so without further ado. Something I learned, if you're gonna read an audiobook, you're not supposed to drink water while you're trying to speak because it washes the natural lubricant out of your mouth. And here I have been drinking water. <laughs> Remind me to hydrate, right? So, <clears throat> so this is the last week of final selection right before we get selected for the Olympic team, just to give you an idea of where we are in the book. As you can see, it's toward the, toward the end. Over the course of those final days, every time we finished a piece, we had no indication of what might be next. Would racing continue or is this the last piece? If not the last, what race distance is next? Is it my turn yet? When will I be switched? I know my turn is coming, it has to be. If not me, whose turn is it? And who will she switch with? When your turn to switch finally comes, as your nerves surge, you step up and out of one boat and into the next to swap places with one of your closest friends and teammates. Someone you race both with and against every single day. You then shakily get situated in your new seat and close the Velcro of your shoes a few extra times for good measure. Then check your oar a few extra times for good measure too. Right when you feel you cannot possibly be any more nervous, you take a deep breath, then let it flow outward from every last one of your pores to calm your nerves so you can focus on what is most important. From there forward, you simply convince yourself that you have more to give on every single stroke. Because if you do not, someone else will. When your piece is over, you wonder if you made this boat better while also wondering how things went over in the other boat without you. Was it even better for them? Was it worse? Was it faster, slower? Will I ever get to sit in that boat again? Did I just win or lose my last shot at the Olympics? While part of you attempts to understand some overarching pattern, the rest of you manages everything you actually have control over. <clears throat> Do I have enough water? Do I have enough food? Yes, more, every stroke, breathe. What else is there? After all, you are allowed to have uncertain thoughts. The key is to breathe and manage them until finally you hear the words. That's it, we're done, take it to the dock. Tom's words came one day earlier than expected. Take a break, go for a 45 minute jog, then wait upstairs in the boathouse. I will meet with each of you individually. By day six, having raised 14 pieces in just six days, each result delivered at the end of each day, Tom and Laurel were satisfied with what information they had. 
either that or time simply ran out. <clears throat> Once Tom spoke his final words, all of two hours remained until we each had our answer. By mid-morning on June 24th, following a 40-minute jog, we gathered upstairs in the boathouse, but sat more quietly than normal, given the gravity of what was about to happen. Then, just as he told us he would, Tom called each of us one by one down the hall and out of earshot of the group for our individual meetings. As I sat and listened and waited patiently, nervously, hopefully, it soon became apparent that people were being called not at random, but in a very specific order. Tom began with Mary, the veteran Cox with an Olympic silver medal to her name, her experience limitless. Having already coxed the eight for six years, it would now be a seventh straight for her. Mm. Next, Tom called Karin, stroke seat, also a silver medal veteran, no one better equipped to sit up front facing Mary and to set the rhythm. At nearly six foot four, her natural length, plus her rhythm that she had honed over more than a decade of rowing by then, made her the best for that seat. Calm, elegant, driven to perform. After Karin came Caroline, my 2005 world's pair partner. Now the Olympic, uh, the Olympic eights seven seat. Her technical dexterity, raw force, and sheer will to succeed made her the natural mirror for Karin's rhythm. Behind Caroline came Susan for six seat, my friend and roommate of nearly four years, genetically gifted in every way. Her height, her physical strength, both attributes perfect to pass back and add power to the rhythm set by Karin and Caroline. Plus with her naturally comedic demeanor, she had a way of relieving our tension. After Susan's came Anna M's turn, Five seat, the third and final, final veteran among us, her strength and experience to back up Susan's, but with an unwavering faith, calm, and an innocence rather than crude humor about her, she bridged the gap between the experience of the stern and the youth of the bow. That began with L, 20 year old L, the teammate and friend who taught me to push myself harder than I, than I ever had in my entire life who also switched from port to starboard shortly after we rode together. Her natural and naive strength perfectly formed for four seat, strong yet still so much to learn. With guidance from those in front of her, she could focus on following and pushing with all her might, which would let her pure joy for the sport shine. Tom had called six names by the time he called Anna G for three seat, the port with whom I had rode the most during my years of full-time training. We had been through an immense amount together, for better and worse, and through it all, I'd come to trust that, like Caroline, Anna G is someone you want in your boat and not lined up against you. My tailbones pressed into the wooden bench as I sat upstairs at the boathouse, awaiting the name that might follow Anna's. Tom had called three starboards by then, so only one spot for someone like me remained. While I waited, my stomach turned as I stared down the long corridor that led to where Tom was and hoped more than anything that he would call me next. All this time, I thought, this is it. As the sun shone diag in diagonally through the windows that overlooked the lake, my cheeks tingled in anticipation until I finally saw Anna G walking my way, her shadow flickering each time she passed through the that doused the long corridor with light. With each step she took, she walked taller and struggled to conceal her smile. Meanwhile, I counted down the remaining 10 seconds before she told us whose turn was next. I could tell by Anna's look that something great had just happened to her. So far, it was a great day for her and those whose names had also already been called. It would not be a great day for everyone though. Inevitably, at least four people would not hear Tom utter the words they so desperately hoped for. When Anna nodded, I knew that zero seconds remained for me. That nod confirmed it. Tom had requested me next. As I walked toward the single most important meeting of my life, my ears pulled rearward and a chill ran down my neck. A chill that continued along my spine between my shoulder blades and down my back. My heart pounded harder with every step I took, 
which caused my throat to pulse just below my jawline. A warm drool accumulated at the edges of my tongue as my nerves welled toward nausea. At last, I sat awkwardly on the edge of a sticky green pleather couch opposite Tom. Well, you know why you're here, don't you? Assessing the look on my face, he paused. Wait, don't tell me your teammates didn't tell you. He paused again, then chuckled. Oh, come on. <laughs> For every year I had been a rower, Molly's comment had held true. No matter how much I thought I knew or how many times I had confronted something, I knew nothing was guaranteed. Because taking nothing for, for granted had gotten me that far, I did not get my hopes up. Not yet, at least. Well, you made the boat, Tom said in the most nonchalant way possible. I had no doubt. You've been consistent. You have a good sense of team. You're a disciplined athlete. And you have done everything I've asked without question. As Tom recounted some of his reasons for selecting me, he helped me see that I had more good performances than bad. Whereas I had fixated on my weaknesses and the times I stumbled, Tom had noted the innumerable more times when I demonstrated the opposite, like rising to the top of the pair matrix back in 2005, or pulling off 11th at that Munich World Cup despite food poisoning or how Anna G and I rebounded to annihilate our competition after being nipped in the pair back in Austria. Or even how now, in that very Olympic year, when paired with Aaron, Esther, or L, we worked our way into the top three pairs on the team. But above all, because I trusted my teammates, our coaches, and our process, Tom thought I was consistent. Because it could sometimes seem like I needed 10 great days to make up for even one bad one, I lost count of my ratio of good to bad. Mm. So I feverishly focused on what I could do better. Though stressful, working one step at a time like that kept me from getting ahead of myself, which helped me improve. The exact way everything progressed over the years, every up and down included, shaped me until I made the Olympic eight. And even though it may have saved a little stomach ache along the way, no, I would not have wanted to know my future. Had even one small thing been different, everything might be different, including the conversation Tom and I had that day. As Tom rounded out his list of reasons for why he selected me, I realized that although it had been hard for me to see, when I stepped back and saw it as Tom did, I finally grasped how far I had come. I'll stop there. <laughs> I actually haven't right. read that part out loud yet. <laughs> but the, you know, the reason why I picked that was because I just, I thought it really reflected all of these moments that really took us from this honestly relatively inexperienced group of athletes mm -hmm. to becoming the foundation of what would become the literally the longest winning streak in any sport, you know, if you're considering world and, and Olympic championships in history for men or women, you know, and when I say relatively inexperienced, you know, there were three of us that had raced at a games before by then. The rest of us, five of us had learned how to row in college, you know, so there were experiences that we had that allowed us to develop for all intents and purposes quite quickly, but in a major way. And it's, it's those experiences that have shaped what I do today. And now having been able to coach for the past, I guess it's 11 years now, applying those experiences to what I've gotten to use with other athletes and other people to help them develop has only reinforced all of those things that we really learned, whether it was the coaches coaching us, the coaches knowing when not to coach us, <laughs> you know, self-reflection and self-awareness awareness of your teammates so that you can learn from them, but also the incredible diversity of who we were. And that's another reason, right? Being able to read those little bits of how I really reflect on each of my teammates in that segment, you know, we were all so different, but we owned literally everything about who we were. We didn't sacrifice who we were to be a part of this thing. In fact, it made us better. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we owned everything that we did as individuals and, you know, mm -hmm. as, as a team. And that just, you know, writing this book has actually made it even more of an opportunity for all of us to get together and really talk about that and reflect on, you know, our, our, that kind of Beijing Olympic cycle in particular and what set it apart from 
years before and years after and why and what actually happened. And, and to be honest, that, that really is what drew me to write this book the way that I did. Mm-hmm. It's three times longer than the original draft in the first <laughs> draft. So. <laughs> so again, thank you. That's why I'm so excited to be here and talk about, I know we have a lot of things, so I'll stop Gavin. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, for those of us who may not know, um, could you talk a little bit about your your start and you know what your personal journey into into rowing so so what opportunities people events that sort of yeah. helped you along the way to to make that decision to train and then to compete competitive yeah. you know i um i nearly drowned in a lake when i was two so sports came into my life at a young age for survival reasons and uh because those of you who are parents, it was also really handy for my parents to take my brother and me to practices because they were like free babysitters. Mm -hmm. And so that was really, and so it was like, what can we do next? What can we do now? What can we occupy our kids time with? My daughter talks a lot. How can we make her really tired? So she doesn't talk so much, you know, stuff like that. So I played probably a dozen different sports, almost a dozen. It was something like 11 different sports. Um, If you consider hitting mulligan golf balls into the bay, you know, a, a sport, then I've, you know, done that too. But despite all the sports that I played and my progress through all of them, I was, truth be told, I was, I was a tomboy growing up. I, you know, got really, I was pretty proficient in most of the things that I did. I had an older brother. I grew up with a bunch of boys, you know, so it was really about me keeping up with them. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> Once I hit middle school, basketball was the sport that I played the longest. I started in third grade and everything I knew about what it took to be a collegiate athlete. I grew up just outside of the University of Virginia. I watched all the UVA athletes. So I had this image of what it meant to be like a real athlete. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel that I was that. And because of how I figured sports worked, basketball was the only sport that I thought I had a chance at playing simply because I had played it the longest. And when I hit middle school, basketball really started to accelerate at a faster rate. The challenges were much greater, much sooner. And that really caused me to question my ability. Um, You know, I I kind of like crawled back into my little shell. You know, I wasn't fast. I hated running. I got the turtle award in middle school, you know, like that's how much I hated running. And so I quit sports. I went to college. I went to the University of Virginia. Um, I got in for academic reasons and then chose, I told myself, and this is what I told everyone was, I'm leaving sports behind. I am going for academic reasons. Little did people know I was just afraid to play a sport, you know, and, and um, over the course of two and a half years, my grades started to tank. My weight started to just shoot up and I just kind of found myself lost, kind of floundering around college and it was the first time in my life that I didn't have a sport to keep me on a path because you know I did my homework I went to class didn't read much when I was in high school but like if I didn't do my homework and do all the things that my teachers asked I couldn't go to practice I couldn't play in the games you know so they kept me doing the things that I should have been doing well without them I did all the other things, you know that a typical college student would and randomly bumped into Kevin Sauer on the University of Virginia campus one day and the uncannily odd eerily serendipitous story of how that all kind of transpired is in the book and you know hopefully I did justice to like just how weird it was that we were able to bump into one another Mm -hmm. and he just saw me and the first thing he said was Lindsay you know it's never too late to row I was tall I was standing there he had heard of me because I was a local kid you know and and he never forgot who I was and he never stopped asking I've dedicated the book to him in part, you know, simply because such a small thing of just being a kind human, reaching out, remembering my name, for goodness sakes, was meaningful to me. It made me feel special and it invited me in. And from day one, even though I tried to run away on my first day of practice, you know, I stuck it out. And the University of Virginia rowing team was just the right fit for me. I found my people again. Tall, I could stand up. You know, it was the first time I wished I were taller. You know, and and I I found people that I had something in common with. We were awkward and didn't know much about things, and that was what I now know. Going through all of this and really doing the research for the book, that really imprinted something that I feel that my teammate Molly and I really carried to the national team when we both moved there, which 
so happened to be in 2003 and 2004. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So that was a long version. <laughs> <laughs> so first, I want to—I I just want to say—I I personally really enjoyed your book, um, and I so enjoyed the experience of reading it. Just, it's a beautifully written book, and and then also just through the sharing of your story with. I felt like just, I could virtually just, I was virtually included in your journey to the Olympics and it was, yeah. it was very informative. And um, anyway, so I was excited about that. And then also excited about potentially the potential of, of, of youth being able to read it. And um, this is a, a hint for all you coaches out there. I just, if you're working with juniors, I highly recommend the possibility of using this book in your coaching. Anyway. Throughout your book, you describe your sensory, sensory experiences as um, informing your training and assisting you in focusing your mind. And I really was aware of that through reading it and could identify with it. Um, and I think everybody can. Um, and I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of that and self-awareness and why learning through all of your senses is like so important um, to becoming faster and also how that sort of also um, adds to you being able to learn by yourself, to, to, to coach yourself. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, gosh, there's so many things that there's just been so much reflection on. This book needs to be written now, you know, to, to quickly go back to, to the question about um, athletes. I had a young woman come up to me and basically, you know, had all that, the P word that you never say out loud, the potential, right? Had all the things, but just couldn't see for herself what she had. And I was like, gosh, we have so much in common. She, I would, we were the same, <laughs> we were so similar. If only she knew like what the future might hold if all she thought was, hey, it's possible. Not, yes, it's gonna, hey, it's possible. You know what, if I start today, it's possible, why not? You know, and, but to go back to the self-awareness thing, it's, it's interesting because my dad would tell you that I didn't, it took me a while to start talking, but as soon as I did, I spoke in vivid detail, like tons of detail, tons of words. And that was something that I just did all the time. Mm -hmm. And I specifically remember when I first started rowing in college, I guess it was within the first year I was in either the 1V or the 2V at UVA. And I just remember the way the bubbles sounded, the way the water sounded on the side of the boat. Mm -hmm. And I even remember turning and looking at it and just watching the water flow by, you know, Kevin thought I was a crazy person because here I am like watching the water go by. Well, you know, how many, you know, two years later, Tom Terhar is literally telling us to stare at the water, you know, like this as we row by. And it was just something that I intuitively discovered because I listened mm -hmm. and I paid attention. And then it was just such a neat sound that I began to look at it and I just started moving according to the way that it sounded and felt. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, for instance, you know, when I first moved to Princeton, which I basically had to say, pretty please may I come, you know, and we were rowing singles. It, we weren't, you know, the, the women's training center had been 20 plus athletes leading up through 2004. Tom's first Olympic cycle started, first full cycle started in 2004. He'd been an assistant prior to that, but he hadn't been a head coach for the entire cycle. Mm -hmm. So his big idea was to tell everybody to leave, like give the vets time to decompress after the games and start with these seven he really, I don't know if he hedged his bets or he was willing to cut us very quickly. I don't know. But there were seven of us that had literally never made an Olympic event at a senior world before. And here we were rowing singles at Lake Mercer. So it was seven of us and Tom. And the fact that we spent all of that time, we spent the vast majority of the first six months only rowing singles unless it was too cold. And then you had to go to the four oar rule, which was like big boats, doubles. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the key to that was to, to literally listen to the boat. You, you pay attention so much to how much can I relax right now? How much can I listen to right now? Mm -hmm. How does this, how does it, how does the way that it sounds literally change when I move differently? And you can kind of time the way the wheels sound with the way the water sounds and the way the oar sounds mm -hmm. and the way that the blade enters the water. And so for me, I was just doing something that I had always done. Mm -hmm. but it turned out to be incredibly helpful um if I, and because then if I flipped it internally you know then I could pay attention to like oh my right arm feels weird compared to my left you know and so you, 
the body gives you so much incredible feedback now that I've studied all the anatomy and physiology of it. It's like, oh, we have so many internal feedback loops if we mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. open our senses to them. Mm -hmm. You know, that really, A, tells the coach that you want to get better, that you're not just relying on whatever they're telling you all the time. It would be lovely to have feedback, but too much feedback is just too much. And it kind of limits what an athlete can discover for themselves, you know, and, and it's that, I know Jessica, you're, you're a teacher and I love education. I don't know how many other educators there are out there specifically, but those aha moments when you facilitate that, and if you've had them before, you don't forget them because you did it, you know, and, and that is one of just the most powerful coaching tools that really exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the other things I got out of the book was just your, for me, it was that just in general, the theme of, of coaching, um, just snippets of things. I was like, Oh, got to remember that, you know? And I was just wondering if you could relay a little bit about what moti motivated you to, to transition into coaching. Although I feel like when you start to row, you start to coach. I mean, I don't, I don't know that that you know what I mean? it's just, it's not separate. And, and you can talk about why that exists a little bit later, potentially related to the, just the conventions around rowing and coaching um, that are in place. But I was curious if you could just tell us a little bit about how you sort of got into it and, and what, how you initially got excited about it and what excites you about it now. Yeah. I did not read a book until I was 26 years old. I hated reading, but now I, I can't get enough. I love learning. I love learning things for myself. And then I get really excited of like, how can I say this in a different way? Because I think it's super cool. I want someone else to think it's super cool too. And Honestly, we used to joke about this, and this was something incredibly unique about those of us that kind of went through that Olympic cycle together, was we were always doing silly things. And one of the silly things that we said was, if you become a coach, at least dress really well. You're never allowed to wear the same pair of pants two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, because it was one of those things where it was like, that's something you could always do. Like, that's a fallback plan, because you have all these skills. Of course, you could become a coach. You know, and I actually, that's why I intentionally wrote in the book. I even was like, I want to put teaching in here because, you know, coaching and teaching really go hand in hand. They just have different classrooms. Um, but it wasn't, it, coaching was something I've resisted. And my mom, I was just telling Jessica ahead of the session that, that my mom has always said, you'd be such a great teacher. And if mom says it, you don't want to do it. Right. And, and lo and behold, after I retired, um, I just naturally fell into coaching because of something to do. I'd moved to Florida to do ocean rescue. It was a part, I live a couple blocks from the boathouse here. And I was like, oh, I can do that part-time while I do that. I'm waiting for this. So it was kind of an accident that I got into it. Um, and when I first started, I really would just work individually, like one-on-one -on -one with kind of the problem kids that they really just couldn't crack the code of the technique. And that was just so fun because you develop that personal relationship and you just continuously look for new ways to say the same thing you know, or new drills to, to get them to do something. And that was something that I, I loved about how Tom coaches is that he doesn't tell you to do something. He tells you to go into left field and do something that seems so completely opposite that it's actually gets you to do what he wants you to do in the first place. You just aren't thinking about what it is, right? And so then you thereby as a byproduct of that other thing end up doing the thing, you know, and, and so that's something that I've always applied, even if it seems strange. And I can tell you the first time I remember seeing someone have an aha moment, and that's what struck me. That's what really hooked me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was actually watching an, a fully grown man learn how to swim, and he took the, his first strokes ever in his whole life, and he just sh shot up out of the pool with his look on his face. I wasn't even coaching him. I was just watching a lesson. And he was so overjoyed by this thing that I thought, my gosh, that's, wow. that's amazing. I want to, I want to do that, <laughs> you know, cause I had coaches that did it for me and I know what it has done in my life. I mean, I hadn't thought about it before, but quite honestly, I was probably depressed when I was lost in college and did, didn't know it cause I had never been that before. So that's why, mm -hmm. you know, Kevin entering my life when he did and saying, Hey, try this. <laughs> and I so appreciate every person that has entered my life since because it truly has completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. Nice. nice. Um, another thing that you, you um, 
you write about in your book is is during the spring of 2008 and it sort of ties in with Tom's coaching and then anyway you'll see where it goes you you, you write about um during the spring of 2008, right before the Beijing Olympics, you were asked to train with a younger, less experienced rower on the national team. Mm -hmm. And it was right before, and it sort of, you, you could tell, I mean, I'm not sure, you'll let, let us know what you were feeling, but what I experienced was sort of like, what? This is like, this is not going in the right direction. You know, I should yeah. be training and orienting someone that doesn't have the life experience that I have um, getting here. And, um, I'm just curious at the time, how did you know to trust, you know, Tom's methodology? I mean, his, you know, and, and then where's, where's, what were some of the benefits of training this new member at this point in your personal training and sort of how and why did this actually ultimately make you a stronger rower and a better teammate? Yeah, I mean, that was, one, I, every part of the book was fun to write, but being able to write about teammates, and of course, before I wrote it, I was like, hey guys, is it cool if I write about you? You know, <laughs> through all that too right um but it was it was this moment of you know it's 2008 the year is here and the first thing that happens you know we always rotated partners and everybody rode with everybody at some point or another you rode with certain people more than others sometimes simply because you know because of how many strokes you end up taking it's it's also a good idea not to always make it challenging you know it's it's nice to have some wins <laughs> so when 2008 started, it was actually Erin was the first person that I rode with. And she had actually been really, I mean, debilitatingly injured. She had been incredibly injured. And so was just getting to the point of full strength to be able to really be consistent in the boat, you know, and, and we'd been really good friends. And here we are repaired together for the first time in, in the two years that we'd been close friends. And it was just like, oh my gosh, I hope this doesn't ruin our friendship. Because... <laughs> it really can like when you get a new pair partner if it goes well you get a new best friend and if it doesn't go well you are just no matter how much you like that person you just need some time apart <laughs> you know um but in that moment you don't have an option it's you must figure this out and so at the time it was oh my gosh I must be doing something wrong like what is what's happening right now I need to get my butt in gear. Like I constantly felt that I had to get my butt in gear, you know, not in a bad way. It was just, oh shoot, I need to do more. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and I wrote this, I included a lot of journal entries in the book on purpose because mm -hmm. I wrote down, people wonder how I remember things. A, I remember a lot of things. B, I wrote them down. You know, I literally would write direct quotes that came out of teammates' mouths, my brain, Tom's mouth, Laurel's mouth, like mm -hmm. the direct quotes that are in the book, most of them are things that I wrote down right after those encounters. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, um, actually it was something that, that Tom said down the line, but uh, thinking in that moment of, of, that you just have to get faster and that's it, you know? And, and it wasn't until down the line that Tom actually approached me and said to me that he thought that I could help the next person, which was Elle that I got paired with. And it was simply because Aaron and I had gotten together and gone faster. You know, and, and then a few years later, Susan actually, Susan Francia circled back to me and divulged a secret was that apparently because of the way that I approached that, I didn't get the like, I didn't cop an attitude ever about it. It was just like, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta figure this thing out. You know, and um, it, apparently he, Tom had gone and told so, Susan at some point or another that he did it intentionally because somehow I helped make other people better. Nice. You know, there was something about when I got with somebody, they figured something out, you know, which I, was a, an incredible compliment. He never told me that. It was like, he told Susan, I don't know if you knew Susan would come back and tell me, but, you know, that was how it kind of, you know, came down to me through this game of telephone. And, and now reflecting on that, like, that is just the, the biggest compliment, you know, and mm -hmm. those are experiences that I also use in my coaching today is every time you get a new partner, you get, you, you literally have like five drills. It's like, here's your, you know, 100 minutes of steady mm -hmm. you know here are your four drills <laughs> go do it so i being a starboard being one of the smaller athletes i was always in the bow of the pair and your job in the bow is to match no matter what like you need to make it comfortable first and then figure it out from there otherwise if you can't take two strokes without being all over the place it doesn't matter you know you need to match first and so you're constantly making adjustments 
whether it's what you're saying or how, when you're throwing it in, you're like constantly trying to figure out a new way to compromise. And I think that that has actually helped me a lot as a coach because I constantly changed my language every time I got a new partner. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Well, sort of expanding on that a little bit, if you wanted to expand on just um, the importance of positive coaching to you and, and how to go about building a positive, productive team culture, it sort of ties in. Because um, you said this is a huge piece of why you wrote the final version of the story in the way that you did. And if this was maybe you could extrapolate a little bit more on that. Yeah, um, as we move more and more toward data, everything is like, let's put the gadget on the thing and measure the number. And there's so much that makes votes go that you can't measure, you know, and mm -hmm. there are subtleties. And I, th and I think, you know, especially with the more, the more technology, the more athletes, especially at a younger age are exposed to everything, even social media, it's just lots of distractions that are out there. It makes it more and more challenging for them to even learn how to pay attention to themselves in the first place. Mm -hmm. Something I learned when I was a kid, you know, but if all I did was play video games and had a phone in my pocket, it, I would be constantly distracted. You know, I, I, I coached for a private school for a number of years. So I worked with fifth and sixth graders and to have a sixth grader make fun of me because he had a nicer phone than I did, you know, that says a lot about how early we're being distracted. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I digressed and I lost my train of thought. Ask your question again. So just looking at... Ah, positive coaching. Yes. yes. Yeah. So the, the reason why um, I bring that up is because I, I really reflecting on a lot of the coaches that I had when I was young, the ones that stood out to me as mentors were the ones that exuded positivity. Right. They right. seemed like they knew everything. They were proud to be who they were and they imparted that on us, you know, and actually I've since gone back and talked to my high school volleyball coach and she's like, I thought I was a terrible coach. I just taught you to throw the ball in the air and hit it. Well, to me, I thought she was just teaching us how to do the basics. And I expressed that to her. I said, you know, that every one of us thought that you were an amazing coach because mm -hmm. she was always positive, but she also gave us numbers. Like it wasn't just one or the other. It was both things. And um, in the last several years, I've actually, this was interesting, it struck me, was that I took a pretty extensive personality test, and I don't, you know, I mean, a free one online, it, you know, the, like, we spend zillions of dollars to do this, to figure this stuff out, and it involved, like, hour-long follow-up conversations, and lots of extra questions, and all the things, and in my top 10 traits, the top four that were tied for number one at, like, 100%, you are 100% this, were purpose, empathy, team builder, and trust, and competitive it was not even in my top 10. And the reason I would say that is because maybe the way they define competitive as like an external thing, like you need to know this number, you need to do this thing, and there is this end game. That, the way that I turn that is, it wasn't about being competitive with something else, it was about being competitive with me. You know, like, and as a group, we were setting a standard. We were doing, we were never looking at another team. Mm -hmm. We were looking at something that no one had ever done before, mm -hmm. you know, and, and let's say, you know, you're working with a young team. We'll back that up a little bit. Let's do, let's do something that you've never done before, mm -hmm. you know, and just set it that way and make it just this incremental improvement. And, mm -hmm. you know, at, at the end of the day, something that I think was incredibly unique about the first Olympic cycle that I was a part of is just how silly we were. You know, we played pranks on each other. We played pranks on Tom. You know? <laughs> because when you do something that is so, that can be, you know, pretty demoralizing. It can be, you know, the, the, your hands are bleeding from the cold, just from the crack that happens because it's so dry in Jersey in the winter. You know, it, it's something I talk about in the book. You're on, it's Friday night, it's dark and it's snowing. And here you are on a stationary bike with a hundred minutes of study to do that you weren't allowed to start until 6.30 at night, you know, cause you're not allowed in the boathouse till 6.30 at night. <laughs> you know, so to, to be able to decompress in all the other ways makes that sustainable. And it also makes you a human and it connects you with your teammates so much better. It makes you so much more willing to learn from that. Um, two last things I'll say about that before we have like a specific, I can talk about this all night because it's a huge piece of what I feel is really missing or overlooked in its value. Um, is that connection first, that positive, mm -hmm. how do I fit here? 
mm-hmm. what, what, it, what unites us. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started coaching uh, full time, I ran a high school program and we had 150 some odd athletes from middle school through 12th grade in one school and four coaches, basically two of us were full time and everybody else was part time coaches. And um, we had a thing where, I, you know, our mantra was basically when you do the right things, the winning takes care of itself. So we actually built a scale that involves, of course, your erg scores and, you know, how many pull-ups can you do and how fast can you run? But it was a lot of different measures over different modalities because different people are going to be good at those things, mm-hmm. you know, but it encouraged everybody to be good at all of them. You know, we would do step-ups, all these, but we also included, are you on time for practice, mm-hmm. you know, and then the coaches could build in, shoot, are you at practice, right? Like, and the coaches could build in like, give me points. We would literally vote as coaches of who's that person that might be overlooked, that is like the hardest worker or always cleans up or whatever it was that stood out. We gave points for that stuff. Mm -hmm. If you needed to do an SAT prep course, we would put a list of, you know, ways that you could earn points you could have a kid never come to practice and literally have all the points. You know? It gave them flexibility because in theory, if you miss practice, whether it's excused, whether you're sick, whether you get hurt, which we never had injury problems, you know, and whatever the reason is, you're still missing out on the opportunity to train. So it put the, the ownership of getting better, you know, on the athletes and, the hardest part about doing that is that you really have to be willing as a coach to say, wow, this really talented kid who never comes to practice, who could erg faster and be a better rower technically than 90% of the team with his eyes closed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to put that kid in the third eight, (laughs) you know, and, Mm -hmm. and that opens up a whole can of worms with parents and all the things, but when you do the right things, the winning takes care of itself and you have to stick to your guns on it, you know? And, and I think that's one of the things about coaching that a lot of people overlook, you know, whether you're a parent with a young athlete or you're the athlete or you're the coach is depending on where you coach. I had a coach say to me when I first started coaching, he said, he said, you're the right person for the job because <laughs> you can risk doing the right thing, right? Like, I, you know, (laughs) he was like, you don't have kids, you don't, and I was like, oh, wow, what are you even talking about? And then, you know, it took me about a year to figure that out, like, you know, you have to know what your moral compass is, and what you're willing to compromise, and what you can't, you know, but you also have to be willing to say, hey, if if I do this, then the 105 other kids that are doing the right things will think we're liars, so we can't, you know, we can't do that, you know, uh, did the same thing when I started coaching in college, Um, instead of starting with, here's the training, everybody, because I get this question a lot, how do I motivate this athlete? Mm-hmm. You know, that comes up a lot. Uh, and I always say, well, have you ever asked them why they're rowing or what they want, how it's helping them be better? Because if they don't want to be there, if you're in high school and mom and dad are making you, or, you know, you're in college and you're thinking about the nine projects that you have, or you're like, you're there for, you know, why, why do a lot of people play sports? Fun, friends, and getting better. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, mm-hmm. I just want to go on a trip, you know, so that's an element too. So understanding and helping young people understand why they're doing it and just how much it matters um, really makes a big, you know, a big difference. So when I first started coaching in college, I suggested to the other coaches and they looked like, they looked at me like I was a crazy person. What if we just walk in and say, what do you guys want to do this year? Do you want to get in some boats and splash around or do you want to go really fast, as fast as you possibly can. And they kind of looked at us dumbfounded. And then finally, it took a little bit of time, but finally one of the athletes in the back of the room piped up and said, we want to win nationals. <laughs> like, what do you mean? What are we doing here? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we said, okay, awesome. If that's true, who else agrees, right? And so then gradually <laughs> most of the room raised their hands until finally we said, all right, because we can train you for that. But in order to do that, it's going to be progressively harder, quite possibly the hardest thing you've ever done. And they were like, okay. You know, so you jump over that hurdle all of a sudden, you're like, okay. Because honestly, whether you ask anyone that you work with or you ask yourself that, for that matter, the answer is the same. This is one of my favorite sayings. Whether you hear them say it out loud or you say it out loud, the answer is the same. And you're gonna put the same into (laughs) the training plan. Mm -hmm. If you don't ask the question, then you start to question, is my training right? 
Mm-hmm. Did I not, did I not rest enough? Did I not do enough of that? Well, if they aren't all in on the project, then it's just a piece of paper. It could be perfect, but maybe you just haven't asked them how much they want it right. to, to get faster, you know, because right. it hurts a lot. <laughs> you know? So how do you, I mean, how do you, what's your method for setting the stage for people to develop confidence as an athlete? And then sort of mm-hmm. parallel to that, what was it that helped you develop your confidence throughout your ongoing rowing and coaching career? I mean, yeah. curious if there's sort of a theme there that, you know. That yeah, I reflect on it. Yeah, I reflect on it in comparison to my, my experience with basketball, where it was just like all of a sudden I'm playing every day. You know, I was in eighth grade playing on three teams and we traveled and it was just you're up till 2 a.m. on the bus on the way back from games. And it was just more than what I was ready for. Mm-hmm. And rowing just happened to enter my life at a point where it was pretty obvious for me to see improvement because I was so slow at running that a speed walker passed me. Like I was terrible at, so I couldn't lift the 45 pound bar. So any improvement was pretty obvious. So I, I actually, all the weight that I had gained, I lost within a you know first spring season. So I was different which of course then elevates your mood, your enjoying. So it really, that mood change was what really initially hooked me. Mm-hmm. I would say, you know, with really young people, you have to let them do, well, with everybody, with everybody, you have to put things in your repertoire that you're really good at and keep them. You know, I told some people yesterday, I was like, if you like the bench press and you hate to squat, do the bench press and love it. Like maybe even do it, you know, like do the thing that you know you're good at and really own it. Mm -hmm. And if you have a partner, you know, that you're training with or something like that, we always did. um, You get to be the best at that thing, you know? And like, I always lifted with Caroline Lind. She was so much stronger than I was. It was just like, my God, if only, you know, but it, it dragged me along as she went. She would just bang out the reps and be done, you know? And here I am like dying, but it really is that, incremental improvement like some things are going to be out of the reach but for every one thing that is a real stretch you have to keep a couple more that are actually quite attainable Mm -hmm. um i I, I started tracking and this was just my anecdotal evidence i started noting that it was like it seemed like it could take you know um, one bad day could wipe out progress of 10 great days and you know, I've, I've recently um started doing some work with the positive coaching alliance and from a coaching standpoint Uh, they discovered that just kind of sort of anecdotally, sort of research-wise, that with a coach, you give five pieces of positive feedback and and then deliver the one, like put the sandwich in there. It's the one thing, which if you think about, if the athlete is coaching, is self-coaching, and the coach is Mm self-coaching, and each of you do five to one, that's, you know, 10 great things to make up for the one other thing. So that it kind of aligns, you know, with with what I kind of discovered on my own because I wrote everything down. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, the, the biggest thing really is when you stumble, you need to be there. With a young person, they might need a word and keeping an eye on the team. You know, I, I feel very fortunate to have gotten into the national team when I did. It was an opportunity that was very timely mm-hmm. uh, because we did have that camaraderie among us. We had unspoken rules that we created on our own. You know, I think that there was an, an article on LinkedIn recently about A players and B players and maybe even C players, I can't remember, but we had a lot of A players that were just, mm-hmm. they just knew what to, how to operate, you mm-hmm. know? You didn't have to say, hey, by the way, when you run hills, you aren't allowed to pass someone on the way down, right? right. You can only, pa- that was just something we always did. Right. My second Olympic cycle, we had to start saying things like that out loud. So it showed how kind of athletes an athlete dynamic had changed where it was like really mm-hmm. you notice that the other 19 people here are not doing that <laughs> no not everybody notices those mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. interesting well this is sort of an aside but a couple of people have asked on the chat they're one they're curious about the title of your book and two um they want to know when you realized you were a writer ah oh ah, yeah Uh, The title, actually, a friend of mine um, that I have known since college woke up in the middle of the night and, like, had this lightning bolt. um, (laughs) She's an artist, so go figure. Uh, It took me a long time to figure it out. But it's it's a play on better late than never. You know, I didn't start rowing until I was 20. I was in the spring semester of my junior year in college. And um, 
it's the idea that, you know, it's, it's clearly it's, it's what that was. And even if we, you know, let's say the entire journey had been the same, right? We talked about the journey. Let's say we didn't win. Well, we became far greater than we would have otherwise been. Right? If we didn't go after it as if we could have won that, like really gone after it with that tenacity to become the best that we could possibly be, you know, our, I say now that you know, winning the games was a byproduct of our collective desire to simply get better, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which in the end it ended up pretty great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But one of my um, favorite things about Mary is that she kind of has like a happy-go-lucky, like I was raised to enjoy what I'm doing and enjoy mm -hmm. life, you know, and that's how I feel too, is, you know, I mm -hmm. was raised to just be better every day, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and neither of us thinks that we're anything special. We just are these people that mm -hmm. happen to find rowing as an outlet, mm -hmm. and it was our way of demonstrating our desire and uh, willingness to learn how to get a little better. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as being a writer, uh, I was, when I was 18, I had a friend that journaled and I thought it was kind of a neat thing. I was like, oh, people do that. You know, it was the first time that I saw an adult keep a journal. And I thought it was just a silly thing at the time. And I was like, oh, you know, she made it okay. So then I started keeping a journal in, um, more than 20 years ago. And a lot of things that are in that journal are in this book. And when I first started journaling, you know, I, I, got picked on when I was in middle school about telling stories and they made my friends made me this little you know construction paper and paper book that said Lindsay's life stories and so it, maybe that planted the seed and so <laughs> then when, I, when I got another journal you know people started giving me journals I was like, are you trying to tell me something and, and so then I started writing random stories and I wrote this book twice wrong I wrote 115 pages twice scrapped most of it and started all over again in October of 2019 and I wrote the first draft in three weeks and it was 40 ish thousand words long and then I spent the next six months I basically spent the pandemic rewriting it my editor that I worked with I would actually consider him more of a writing coach than an editor because he didn't what he did was he asked questions he asked a lot of questions tell me more about this you see how this is going give me two more details and that allowed me to learn so to go back to what you're saying about reading the Row 360 article, that was really what I reflected on. I was like, holy crap, all the things that I did as a rower, I need to continuously apply here because writing a book is very hard, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, if I didn't really want it to be done, then I would have stopped in the middle and been like, do I really want to write a book? I did ask myself that sometimes because you wake up at 2.45 in the morning with an idea and you dump it onto the paper. But I do have ideas for other books. There is more to the story. Mm -hmm. I um, did not retire until 2010. And my experience from 2008 to 2010 was a very different one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lot to unpack in that story. I did not get hurt for the first seven and a half years of my Olympic career, which in has informed a lot about the habits that I kept and how we overcomplicate what it takes to stay healthy, particularly when we mess with our nutrition for one reason or another. Like we keep trying, we keep on trying to change the science, but we've known so much for ever, <laughs> you know? And now I just like, you know, keep, keep reading the research and keep reading and it just really, you know, confirms a lot of the things that I just did naturally, so. Another question that came in, it sort of ties in with just what you were touching upon was how different do you feel the U.S. team is training like now than when you first made the team and what has changed the most, do you think? Um, when we first started, I think maybe people forgot that we started with 4K. Our first day of practice was we cleaned the boathouse and I, and this is, that's why I wrote that. I was like, that story needs to be in the book. People need to know that in 2004, September 2004, seven strangers showed up who didn't know how to skull, hopped in singles and rode singles. But our first day was the seven of us in Tom Terhar cleaning the Mercer Boathouse. We reorganized, we put all the big boats up high because it was like, let's be clear, we are not rowing team boats. You guys need to figure out how to row by rowing the single, you mm -hmm. know? And so that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And we went out after that and did 4K, about 20 minutes on the water. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Because I kept all those notes, I actually went back when I first started coaching and looked at the percentages. And then when I was in grad school, looked at our volume and all these things, Mm -hmm. there was a perfectly methodical amount of volume that increased. It's just that we started at 4K and then gradually built up over time. Mm -hmm. What makes that sticky is when people... People don't graduate from college every four years. They graduate from college every year. (laughs) And so some people enter one year in, some people enter two years in, some people enter three years in, and maybe they had a bigger in college and they try to jump into the volume and they're not ready for it. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether, you know, when they get in there, there is a certain amount of team pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, the coaches set this larger, larger, broader context And then if someone enters, they don't know what people are saying in the locker room. They are not hanging out in there, you know? And so they only know what framework they're creating, Mm -hmm. how that gets interpreted by each individual person, particularly if a new person wants to make the team immediately, Mm -hmm. you know, um, then it gets kind of like, is this a lot? Like, what am I used to? Mm -hmm. College athletes are also training a whole lot more, you know? Um, in 2000, um, we lost really, really badly in 2005. Um, we'd done more than we'd ever done in our lives. And so when we came back in the fall of 05 and then moving into 2006, um, we were doing, we eventually started doing more. So we would go out and do 24 K in pairs, you know, and, and, and that was a lot of volume. Kate Johnson, who had been in the 048, I remember her saying, it was a story I wanted to put in the book. It just didn't fit. Um, she said, you guys are doing more volume now than we did in the Olympic year, you know, and, and the way that, and then we backed off a little bit because Tom would gauge that of like, okay, this is, uh, we're not ready for this, you know, especially if you're doing it in pairs. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, they do have a cap on how much volume they're actually doing. The, the dynamic of the athletes has, has changed. And the last thing I'll say about it is that if the same people stay. So if you have people in the training center longer and longer, mm-hmm. over time, you have to change a stimulus in order to get a greater adaptation. So if someone has been doing X amount for a prolonged period of time, you need to play around with the variables, right? So there's only so much volume you can do, right? There's, there's just not enough time in the day. Mm-hmm. And then as people age, and this is something I have a huge appreciation for, because mm-hmm. there are case studies out there, you know, the athletes that stay in it the longest spend less time doing all the volume and more time recovering because you have to, you literally have to, that is how our bodies work, especially once you hit a certain age, you know, and it, I would also say that athletes that um, are successful the longest, not necessarily stay in it the longest, because some people here, right, so who performs at the highest level for a really long period of time I would guess that they're a lot of them are probably pretty self-aware, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Like they, they have an element of like, you know what, I am willing to say, Hey coach, I need this really desperately, you know? And, yeah. um, but then, or this, and this is why this is my plan, you know, and, and that's the maturity of the athletes, but you have to have that experience first. I think, um, when you start to also mix age groups, you know, I, I don't know what other you know, um, countries do in terms of how their, how their governing bodies work. But I think it would really do the athletes a service to kind of come in and have like a novice coach that is an empath, you know, or, or have, um, sports psychology 101, exercise physiology 101, Mm -hmm. just so that everyone understands Mm -hmm. I'm 21. I'm really excited. I just came out of college. You might be able to handle a little more over here. Mm -hmm. I'm 39, (laughs) you know, or I'm 31 or whatever it happens to be, to be able to understand the different needs, right? Here's how we overlap. Mm -hmm. Here are the individual needs to be the best that we can be as a group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I've got lots of questions, but I wanted to open it up to (laughs) everybody that's here. If you have any questions for Lindsay and feel free to unmute yourself and um, I'm going to go ahead and unpin us and if you'd like to ask any questions. Hopefully this has been helpful and interesting. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Let's see here. <laughs> We've talked about a lot. Yes.
Uh, Favorite so snack to reach for? That was actually, that was one of your questions too. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, fun fact. I went to my first world championships eating granola bars, toast, and cereal. And then I learned, <laughs> right? Um, my favorite snack now, particularly after or during a training session, is actually dates because mm -hmm. of the vitamins and minerals that you get in there, plus the quick sugar that will help you kind of recover afterward. But uh, mixed nuts and dates, loads of antioxidants in there, loads of quick replacement fuel. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually ate a lot of oatmeal. Um, the more intact the oatmeal, the better. So moving down the like instance way over here, you know, and so then rolled oats, then um, steel cut, then groats, like get, the closer to intact you get, you're just getting more good stuff that'll feed your body to be strong. Um, I, <laughs> I actually had a pretty sensitive stomach. Either that or I could just create a really acidic environment inside my body. Uh, so much so that I actually, whenever we had a race coming, I would take Pepto-Bismol and eat white bread and honey because I just couldn't stomach anything else. Like when you're in Europe and they don't have oatmeal for you, you're trying to find whatever you can that is palatable, honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 question popped up. So you're getting some comments here. Let's see. Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, what else? I'm curious. So I've heard in, in, in another interview that you did, and you, you talked a lot about, or you emphasized the importance of being a consistent coach. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. I, I think that is pretty significant. And yeah. yeah. You know, these, these like light bulb moments that you just kind of retain, like I, they really, I, they stick. I actually had this theory. I was like, does having a good memory make you a better athlete? Because you can remember all the things that the coach tells you. <laughs> yeah. Can you hold those in your head? Uh, you know, there's really, how could you prove that, I guess. Um, but the consistency, the person that said to me, you're the right person for the job because you can risk doing the right thing, also mm -hmm. said to me, no matter what you choose, mm -hmm. be consistent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are people that you work with and whether it's an athlete, a co-coach, you know, that you learn mm -hmm. things to do and you learn things not to do. You're like, oh, I need to make sure that I sleep a lot so that I don't freak out at practice, you know, like have that, like, okay, I need the extra so I can respond appropriately in these situations. The consistent piece is a huge part of building trust. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the consistency, like, much like I said earlier about if we made the exception for that one kid, then what does it tell us? What does it tell the rest of the athletes? Mm -hmm. eh, just kidding. You guys have to do all the work, but that guy doesn't just because he's special, you know, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I do because I feel that I am this person, you know, mm -hmm. my fastest 2K was a 648.9. You know, I think we had two or three athletes in our Beijing 8 that broke 640. Now there are two dozen or more breaking 640, but the boat is not showing a significant amount more speed, right. you know? And so it's like, are you doing absolutely everything you can with what you have? And that is the much more important value to teach because that's going to elevate everybody, you know? And mm -hmm. then again, you have to, that's kind of a, a conversation to have with yourself too, if you're a coach. Mm -hmm. Um, early on is to say, if you find yourself in a situation where someone says, you must make this decision or you are no longer a coach, mm -hmm. that's an important reality too, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. especially if you're dealing with parents and all the rules and all the things, you know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's the unfortunate reality, you know, I, I still maintain hope that um, deep down we all want to do the right thing. It's just a matter of helping people understand like, hey, this is use Kath, the title of Kath Bishop's uh, book, The Long Win, you know, mm -hmm. like what is winning really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something I love about the Positive Coaching Alliance. A great resource mm -hmm. um, is that they care about competition and winning, but mm -hmm. they care about life lessons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and winning never trumps the teaching the life lesson. If ever you have to make a choice, the life lesson always mm -hmm. is the more important thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a couple more um, biggest lesson learned from a mistake. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, I, the first thing that always comes to mind uh, in coaching specifically, I mean, shooting, 
<laughs> in rowing, there were lots of little things. It was almost like I just had the right personality that Tom could kind of give me a hard time more so than anybody else, right? He would do have me do things or say things that my teammates would be like, do you remember when he said that? I was mortified. And I'm just thinking like, oh, I thought he was joking. Like, <laughs> you know, like that's how I took it. You know, I played middle school basketball. I played high school basketball. I was like, you need to go play basketball <laughs> and you will change the way you think about any rowing coach you have ever had. Um, but biggest mistake as a coach, I would say when I first started coaching and we built out this accountability scale, right? That included subjective and objective measures. When I sat down with all the coaches that I was working with, I was like, guys, you've all been here longer than me. What needs, what, what is the biggest issue? What is our thing that we need to really tackle first? And they said attendance. We had more than a hundred kids on the team. 30 some odd kids would show up on a regular basis. And yet they were getting PE credit for coming to practice. So I said, okay, let's lean on the school's rules. For every three days you miss, you lose a letter grade. And we would take attendance religiously and report that back to the school. Yeah. The school didn't hold up their end of the bargain. They didn't back us up on that, which was weird to me, but because it was literally in the school handbook. But what we did when we initially drafted the rules was if you miss practice, you would lose points on your scale, right? And a kid sees that and is like, I'm going to lose points? Like what? You know? So never take something away, <laughs> add, right? You get a point for coming to practice. You get extra points for going for that th extra recovery jog or setting up the community service project. You know, we always did community service projects once a month. I always had a parent volunteer that would run that, but that mistake was take points away because then that turned everybody. It was like, it became this thing that blew out of proportion for no reason. It was like, wait, how? And at the time, it didn't even dawn on me that there was a difference, but there's a big difference. Yeah, yeah. So are you good for a couple more questions, Lindsay? Or? Sure, there are questions, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So um, what are some strategies you have used to handle the pre-race or pre-erg uh, test anxiety? Pepto-Bismol for one. <laughs> uh, I never drank coffee. I never, until I turned 30 years old living in Florida, wow. uh, drank coffee the whole time I trained, wow. never did. I never ate a ton of protein. I never took supplements, none of those things. Wow. But the routine really matters. You know, uh, there's a reason that it's the, it's the type of distraction that you want to have, right? Don't dive into the phone that messes with your eyes and your brain and all this stuff. Um, but the routine really matters. And I very specifically, we talked about this in advance, you know, that I very specifically wrote my entire race day routine in the book. Mm -hmm. I wrote how my mindset and what I spoke to myself, the way I talked to myself in my head, mm -hmm. I wrote very specifically about how that changed over time and why, you know, because just like taking away points, even though technically gaining and losing, it, it does the same thing to your overall score. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between mm -hmm. taking no fear and turning it into yes more or mm -hmm. go now, right? Mm -hmm. So don't wait is not the same as go now. Mm -hmm. right? It's all positive with your wording. Mm -hmm. I had an athlete um, from the UK actually reach out and say that she used to always say, don't give up, you know, because that's on the t-shirts, it's on it. But if you mm -hmm. say in your head, don't give up, all that your brain is processing when you're stressed out is give up, give up, give up, right. you're playing right. the seat. Right. So instead, even if it's, I don't like keep going, but go. <laughs> 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 and progressive, like forward progress all the time. Um, but yeah, the, having that routine, my, my routine involved, you know, if, if a race were coming up, particularly if it's like a really big race over the years, I did this three days out, I would really make sure that I was paying attention to how hydrated I was. Nice. I would take really deep breaths where it was like, poke out your belly and let your diaphragm really, like let everything expand. Could I squeak out like a slightly deeper breath? And I would just, I just liked how it felt. It relaxed me. Come to find out, deep breathing triggers your parasympathetic nervous system, you know. Mm -hmm. Talk about paying attention. Turns out there is science to back up all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I would take a shower because it would help me stretch. Mm -hmm. I would stretch. Mm -hmm. I knew how far in advance before the event I would eat. Because, you know, you're, everyone is give or take like three or four hours, I would say, back it up. If you have a really sensitive stomach, eat minimally and pretty blandly four mm -hmm. hours out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
little trick that I've since learned is that if you're doing a 2K, you don't need much carbohydrate to do that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You could literally, if you have a super sensitive stomach and I've had athletes do this, mm -hmm. they would take, you know, now that I have, I would suggest other things like honey perhaps or brown rice syrup because that's soft on your stomach. But at the time, Gatorade was all you had or swish it in your mouth. Your brain goes, I'm going to get food soon. Here's a little extra energy. Right. So you'll have the energy to get through a test, even if you spit out what was in your mouth. You just need to stimulate your taste receptors in your mouth because, not to digress into too much science, but you, you actually, salivary amylase, you start to break down some carbohydrate, it goes to your brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You get what you need without upsetting your stomach. And the last piece of that that I'll say, it's all, again, all in the book. I even intentionally included the fact that I would brush my teeth because <laughs> it, it restarted my day, especially if I took a nap, you know, take a nap, wake up, brush my teeth. I'm fresh and new. I liked the minty fresh feeling. Come to find out they've done research on peppermint and peppermint oil. It literally perks people up. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's why everybody's happier at Christmas time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But again, that intuition, that paying attention, I brushed my teeth one morning and was like, I can breathe. I feel great. My lungs, you know, and it was just something I kept. Every little bit helped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, not to you know, belabor the point, but Tom used to drop things too. He would say the most random things. And I was like, man, everything he's told me so far has been helpful. So <laughs> it was, even if it was something so silly and tiny as, hey, don't share your water bottle, right? Like, I would do that because he didn't want us to get sick. Right. Sharing is not actually caring. Okay. <laughs> like that, something so silly. And I was like, ah, Tom, don't do it. I did it. I adhered to that because he was right. If I got sick, that was on me. Right. And so every little bit. Right. 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 Okay. A couple oh. more. Uh, oh, so. Music too. Having your, your playlist helps you. And, and this is something I go back and forth with is with athletes, like mm -hmm. as a coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of coaches are like, no music on test day, you know, you got to deal with it. You don't have music in the boat. And I understand that side of the argument. Mm -hmm. However, if music elevates their effort week after week, or your effort week after week, your training effect is going to be better over the long haul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't get it in the boat, but you get it leading up to that point that you step off of the bus at the race and you're like, yeah, I am standing tall, you know, mm -hmm. the training effect element of that is what I would say is mm -hmm. far more important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple more. Um, you mentioned your um, coach at everyone first row in singles. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think improving skills in singles leads to better rowing in eights? I'm hoping so since we're all rowing in singles now. Yeah, so <laughs> funny that you say this. I've actually kind of joked around with people like, you know what the pandemic is going to do is we're all going to be better at rowing <laughs> right? <laughs> right? because we're spending time on the erg and we're spending so much time on the erg that it's like, well, I guess I better do some drills. We always did drills on the erg. Mm -hmm. Never once did Tom ever tell us during our cycle because it has since changed. Mm -hmm. Did he ever tell us just hit the number? No, you wouldn't tell somebody to go squat really badly just to do the weight, go Google search CrossFit fails. Don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. Row the erg, mm -hmm. like literally row the erg, he would say. We would do all the drills that we did on the water, we would apply them to the rowing machine. That way you are never degrading what you learned while you're on the water. It's similar enough, it's not the same, it's cross training. It's similar enough that it will take away from the progress that you've made on the water, right? Mm -hmm. So can you make the erg feel the same way that the boat does? Mm -hmm. It's possible. You know, it's, it's very possible to get as close as you can to that. Mm -hmm. um, in the single, it, <laughs> one of my favorite jokes, one of the first jokes Tom ever told us was, if you're not good in the single, you'll get really fit really fast. <laughs> because you're it's gonna, you're gonna make your life so much harder. <laughs> and you And you eventually, your body naturally, intuitively starts to figure things out. It finds efficiency in some way, shape or form. Right. Um, but yeah, absolutely rowing the single. Not only does it allow you to um, take more strokes in a small boat with tons of feedback with no one else to blame it on but you, 
it's safer because there's no rotation. So most people that you see go through multiple Olympic cycles or row for a very long period of time. They'll row both sides of the boat and mm -hmm. they'll skull. Um, that absolutely with everyone that I've seen be successfully make it from cycle to cycle, they spend time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. changing it up, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there was something else I was gonna say and I forgot what it was. Yeah. <laughs> And then I think this is our last one here. Biggest aha in terms of improving your stroke. Oh gosh, there are several. Um, I, one of my one of the first ones I wrote about in the book was rowing circles in the pair. Um, yeah, uh, but there was actually there were most of my aha, big 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 aha moments were in that first year because I I literally went from you know the, the way that I put it in the book because I did the math was like 56th on the national team hierarchy the first second pre-league camp that I went to I was literally like number 56 on the totem pole and within one year had clawed my way to the fastest starboard in the country right? Over Olympic athletes, you know, people that had just gotten the silver medal at the games one year later, here I am like, wow, I'm 15 seconds slower than you on the erg. And I'm going to go race the pair and the eight. <laughs> so how did that happen? You know, they're in, in Gifu in Japan, but rowing circles slowly and not overdoing it. Right. And that's where, and I remember rowing those circles and it reminded me of paying attention to the water flowing on the side of the boat back when I was in college. It was the same thing. And Tom was literally telling me to do what I had done intuitively in college. Mm -hmm. Never before had a coach encouraged me to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I just did it on my own and thought it was this thing. So then when what he was saying matched what I had figured out on my own, and then the very fact that he could describe exactly what I should be feeling. I have literally to this day, never seen the man take a stroke in a boat. I'm like, does he even know how to row a boat? I don't know. I've seen him get in the tank once, but somehow oh my God. Knew exactly what I should be feeling every single time I moved. And I was like, he's right. I, he's right. I am feeling that right now, you know? And so that helped me build a trust even more because I was like, holy cow, mm -hmm. how is he reading my mind right now? You know, mm -hmm. again, particularly because I had to this, I have to this day still never seen him take a stroke on the water. <laughs> that's a good yeah. tip coaches i think definitely yeah. yeah uh you know the other aha moment and people don't know this and my teammates have even forgotten this i tell people that i learned how to row four days before our olympic final we had raced the heat wow. a few days later all of a sudden we went out for practice and tom told us to do something completely different than what we had been doing for the previous two years mm -hmm. and we were like what we went from you know a, a very collected mm -hmm. you know send and gather at the finish to i could not move my hands fast enough wow. but the risk of that and why he waited and this is my interpretation of it and it makes complete mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. you can eventually overdo it with your arms right mm -hmm. the whole point was that we still needed the rest of our body to act as if we were still gathering. We just needed our hands to pick yeah. up very carefully mm -hmm. as our knees broke, mm -hmm. you know? And it, and it makes everything feel so light and mm -hmm. springy and fast. Mm -hmm. But it was, I just, I remember being like, now? Like, I, I don't know that I can move. I mean, it was just faster, 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 faster. Mm -hmm. And he, I distinctly recall him telling me like, just literally faster faster and faster until finally I went so fast. I thought, my God, this can't be what he wants. And sure enough, it was, you know, he was just looking for it to match the speed of the boat. Wow. 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 That's a... <laughs> um, well, <laughs> anything else? I mean, we could go on for a really long time. I've got a long list of stuff, but I'm not, but I, I just wanted to, again, see if anybody else had any last questions for Lindsay. And um, you're getting, I don't know I'm, if you're I'm in the ether. You can always find me too. That's if true. something comes up tomorrow or next year or in 10 years. I, every athlete that I've ever worked with, I always tell them, you can find me. It's the internet. Yeah. And if you need something or you just want to say hi in 10 years, like this is how that works. <laughs> you know, this, is, this does not end at the end of this day or when you graduate. <laughs> so... 
Well, do you want so just to let everybody know the information okay. and how to contact Lindsay is on the chat at the very top of the chat. And um, Lindsay, do you want to share any last bits about or sort of what you have going on now and um, potentially anything that people can get involved with um, that you have going on now? <laughs> What do I have going on? I have three things. You have things a lot going on. All <laughs> kinds of random things. Um, something that I'm very excited about is my hometown newspaper put out an, an article called The Importance of Athletics. Mm -hmm. And basically, like the whole article actually encompassed this book, but also concepts that would be in the second book. And it got picked up by the Associated Press. So hopefully, nice. it, yeah, because the article really is about like, kind of the athlete identity crisis. I went through a little bit coming out of high school, yeah. but then to experience that again, and that's book two. Like yeah. I experienced all of that when yeah. you win the Olympics with that group of people that were just so phenomenal. And I wrote into the book about this, Anna Michelson's comment about savoring this moment because you yeah. never know yeah. when you might be here again. And yeah. at the time I was like, what are you talking about? I'm coming back. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Right. We crossed the finish line in 2009 and it was very anticlimactic. It was like, we were kind of not that good and we still won like that was okay um but th it was just really cool to see that get picked up and and hopefully people outside of the sport um as far as as things going it's i, I don't have anything on the top of my head okay. <laughs> keep it on us rowing and if yeah. you want to stay updated as things do come up you know i do have things coming up but they're for specific groups or like right. interview podcasts and things like that right um Spartan Up is actually a pretty cool podcast. I'm supposed to um, talk to them on Monday. It's the guy that started the Spartan race. What is Spartan, it? Spartan, Spartan Up. Okay. Um, but we're, we're just now going to be recording that on Monday. So I don't know when it'll come out, but it, it's a really cool way to get out into the broader community for that. Okay. And just to mention, there's a really great um, interview that you did with, um, I don't know the gentleman's name, but it was FS, FSU coach. Oh, yeah. In, in yeah. December, yeah. specifically on coaching. It, it's fabulous if, if you guys yeah. are checking FSU out. coach. He does a lot of really great things. He is yeah. at Florida State. That's why it's FSU coach. And yeah. then all the letters, C-O-A-C-H, stand for something. And and he is, they are at the forefront of basically a master's degree in, to make coaches be better, to help coaches be better. Like, mm -hmm. he, he firmly believes that, all coaches should have upper level training, not just, you know, I, my kid is a sixth grader or is six years old. Right. And I want to go to soccer. Well, right. and, and, and as I mentioned to the positive coaching Alliance, if you want other resources, they have a lot of free resources. They also have little classes, but the, the thing that I like is that they do, I haven't gone through everything yet. Um, some of the things that are in there are literally words that have come out of my mouth for the last 10 years. And lo and behold, they've been <laughs> preaching these things. But they're also, they also have strategies for like dealing with the problem parent or how do you get this, you know, so that's really nice to see. And it's all based on research. It started in st at Stanford in the Stanford Athletic Department in 1998. So it is all fact-based, you know, and, and or research-based, I should say. Carol Dweck is um, mm -hmm. on the board for them, you know. A lot of really big um, researchers, athletes, coaches. So they, they have some really good resources available for sure. But yes, I'm glad you saw that and that you brought it up because Tim is a very thoughtful person and wants to, and yeah, I really enjoyed that interview specifically because of the coaching um, um, elements of it. Yeah, yeah. I, th I thought it brought a lot out, a lot out, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of good stuff in it. Um, so I think we will wrap it up here, you guys. And um, I, Lindsay, I'm sure you can see the chat, but I will read. People are just lots of, lots of thanks and 